Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to our second panel session on the future of regulation and standards in the drone industry. Today, we've heard from many of the speakers the need for participation, coordination, collaboration, and convergence to ensure innovation in drones can flourish uh, and the market in a safe, secure, and efficient way. In this session, we will explore the current regulatory frameworks and why we need to collaborate and coordinate across the regulatory authorities within country and also globally. We, we heard, I think it was Peter who said, there's a need to talk the same language between the different regulators. So anyway, let's see if we can address some of those questions now and, 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 uh, and bring you all up to speed on what is happening. So it's my great pleasure to introduce our distinguished panels, panelists from Australia, Malaysia, and Singapore. And they represent regulators from both the Civil Aviation Authorities, the Telco and IC Authority as well. So uh, the first panelist is uh, Heath McDonald. He's from uh, the Operations and Standards at CAS CASA, the Civil Aviation Authority. Uh, Heath has a wealth of experience in unmanned aerial systems in the in Australian Defence Force and at CAACA. Uh, we've also got Captain Akila, the head of the UAS at CAM. Hi the Civil Aviation Authority of Malaysia. Also from CAM, I'm pleased to welcome Badil Rosli, who is the Assistant Director of Technology at the UAS. And a, a, a very well uh, known friend of uh, GSMA, Chong Hai Tu, uh, tu, tu the Director of Infocom Technology at IMDA. The IMDA is the uh, regulatory authority uh, for telecommunications. Uh, Hai Tu also holds a concurrent appointment as a director of the 5G program office in Singapore. And I think that will also bring some of that knowledge into this section. So what I'm gonna do is that we're gonna do something slightly different because when I looked at, uh, when we had a discussion about this, there's a, from, the, uh, from the audience here, I know there's a very mixed group of people, you know, some have got a lot of knowledge and some are at the start of that journey of knowledge. So what we thought we'd do is I, when I talk to my panelists that we do, Ask them each to prepare an overview of what their government is doing in uh, drones and urban air uh, mobility. So first of all, I'm going to do this in alphabetical order. So Australia will be invited first to speak. So Heath, could you uh, give me a little bit of a talk, introduce yourself and then talk a little bit about the situation in Australia? Sure. Thanks very much, Jeanette. Just ensure everyone can see that. Yes, we can see. Uh, so look, I've been with uh, CASA, which is probably much easier to say uh, than CASA, to be quite honest. So I've been with CASA for going on three years now. Um, previous experience was in uh, the Australian Defence Force operating uh, the Shadow 200 UAS system, um, which is a, approximately 200 kilo UAV, so it's a substantial size. Um, considering other, uh, most commercial, most of the commercial market at this stage. Um, and I was operating uh, mostly BV loss long distance um, for various reasons under, for the Australian Defence Force, essentially. Um, so yeah, joined CASA and I've uh, made my way up to the team leader position for the ARPAS um, branch. So remotely piloted aircraft systems branch. Uh, and currently working through a, quite a substantial amount of projects um, and developments that we're looking at uh, from the Australian government perspective, which I'll, I'll run through shortly. So look, firstly, well, not firstly, I'd just like to say thank you to GSMA and uh, also Iskandar for the invitation uh, to CASA to present here. Um, and it's only through these sorts of workshops that we can really understand what's going on elsewhere in the world and also collaborate on these things. So I've, um, the panel discussion just prior, I was furiously writing notes down and I, it, very good to discuss and just get that insight in. So it's, I can ho I hope I'm as much benefit here as what I've already seen through this workshop. So look, Australia was uh, essentially the first country to implement regulatory framework for uh, drones. And it was first initiated in 2002 our regulations came out. So what this has allowed is for CASA to propel forward 
and facilitate these new and emerging technologies really more efficiently uh, through the established set of regulations that we have. Um, look, this is not to say that we haven't endured challenges along the way and overcoming these required us to decide uh, which regulatory lever to pull, so to speak. Uh, through our regulatory framework, we provide a personnel licensing system and also operator certification. As you can see on the current slide, uh, Australia has over 21,500 remote pilot license holders. And this is, was, is seen as an average increase of 3,500 licenses per year since 2016. Um, although this figure remains below the conventional flight crew licenses, we do expect REPLs to overtake within the next few years. CASA's framework also permits certification of RPA, RPA operators, essentially companies, and certification for an RPAs operator um, affords further privileges when compared to our uh, commercial sub two kilo excluded category, which is a framework that allows low risk operations yeah, in layman's terms. A certified, op certified operator then may apply for and conduct high risk operations. And depicted on the slide by the term operator certificates, the amount of VARP has certificates now doubles that of conventional aviation certificates, which is probably a, a good indication of uh, where the ARP has community is right now, uh, especially within Australia. Uh, I have placed a, a figure of 1.2 million drones estimated within Australia. This is more so based off a uh, calculation from data around drone ownership within United States. Um, so 5% of Australians owing to 1.2 million drones estimated. So the figure is still relatively unknown um, and I believe that will be the case for some time. So now that I've discussed um, somewhat about where Australia currently is in the RPAS space, I'd like to touch on where Australia may be within the next five to 10 years. And really to start with, uh, one of the major projects we've, we are currently um, doing as part of CASA is a post implementation review of our regulatory framework. And considerations for this review include lessons learned from performing regula regulatory services, uh, creating an industry-led technical working group and consulting more broadly on the proposed changes within Australia. We expect these changes to occur within the next few years, and these aim at ensuring safety levels are met between each other is key uh, um, and occurs quite regularly. An example of this is a recent six-month trial of a digital automatic airspace authorizations around three aerodromes. Uh, similar to the US Lance-like system. Um, and the trial has been conducted in partnership with Castor and Air Services. Uh, I'll finish off on my last slide with the 14, I've just identified 14 key initiatives from the NEAT paper. Uh, and I'll touch on three of them, which is probably the most interest. So UTM action plan. So with UTM, um, Australia is committed to the development and management of a safe, secure, efficient and market-driven UTM ecosystem. The UTM action plan is for development and deployment of UTM within Australia. It will be consistent with UTM guiding principles in the policy statement. So you can read what, our, what the Australian government's guiding principles around UTM actually are. They're much too long to uh, try and um, present here. Um, but essentially it must be created in accordance with these, um, Australia's future airspace framework as well needs to be considered and the general broader approach around, um, what's being presented in the NEAT policy paper for drones, um, in general. The next initiative is the aviation safety regulatory roadmap and, uh, CASA has established a technical working group to provide industry insight. 
an understanding of current needs uh, and utilise relevant technical expertise for the development of the roadmap to guide CASA's future regulatory approach in support of ARPAS uh, and advanced air mobility in Australia. Lastly, I just wanted to touch on the Emerging Aviation Technology Partnerships Program. So the, the Department of Infrastructure has included a strategic partnership program between industry and the Australian government. And this will provide, provide opportunities for a number of industry partners uh, to demonstrate the capability with emerging aviation technology in five key areas, which is growing manufacturing jobs in electric aviation, improving health outcomes for remote indigenous communities, connecting regional communities through passenger transport and cargo, digital farming and boosting regional supply chains. So to wrap up, um, look, we see workshops such as these key to ensuring we're moving in the same direction with respect to the rest of the world. Um, and if you'd like to read any publications that I've mentioned today uh, or sources that I've used, I'll supply a list of links to Jeanette who uh, may be able to post them or send them around. Yeah. So once again, thanks again for inviting us and being able to present. Thank you, Heath. That was really good. A very uh, good comprehensive overview. And I'd actually recommend, uh, we will put the link in the, uh, the chat box, the policy paper. It's, a very, it's actually a really good read. It's readable and uh, it, it, it shows how hot of the, the approach the Australia is taking. And as we saw there, there's some collaboration. I'm going to ask Heath a little bit more about collaboration with other regulators a bit later on. But uh, you could see there the, the uh, if you like, a little bit of a whole of government approach in the way they're working across uh, different parts of the, uh, at least in, within the aviation industry. So um, now I'd like to now go on to Captain Akila. I think you're going to do the presentation, is that correct? Yes? Yeah. And so we're going to hear now about Malaysia. I know this is going to be, you know, you, uh, we're doing one after the other, but I think it's quite useful to see with the two different approaches, or well, similar approaches actually in lots of ways. And then last but least, we'll come to, not least, we'll come to Haitu, who's looking from the uh, telco and communications regulations. So I think that will be a nice uh, sort of all-round uh, view of what we're, uh, the different policies and regulation framework in APAC. So over to you, Captain Akila. Thank you, Jeanette. I saw my common greetings. Uh, before I begin, I would like to thank GSME and Ignite for calling us to share within this forum. I am Akila, previously an airline pilot with AirAsia uh, on the Airbus fleet and currently the head of US unit. The US unit itself is under Flight Operations Division within Civil Aviation Authority of Malaysia. And the US unit is actually in an in infancy stage as the US unit was only established um, sometime this year. With me today is also Mr. Fadil. Um, maybe I'll get Fadil to, present, uh, to say something first before I begin with the slides. Thank you. Hello. Good evening, everybody. My name is Fadil uh, Rosli from uh, US unit Flight Operation Division CM. Thank you. Thanks, Fadil. So Fadil, he's uh, actually um, in charge of technology and partnership within the US unit. Okay, let me get on to the slides. Uh, I would like to brief a bit on the Civil Aviation. The Civil Aviation Authority of Malaysia, previously known as Department of Civil Aviation, Civil Aviation is a government agency that was formed by the Ministry of Transport back in 1969. Effectively, in 2018, DCA was incorporated into a statutory body known as CAM. CAM holds a single mission, which is to continuously enhance the safety, security, and efficiency for a sustainable aviation industry, which includes, but not limited to, unmanned aircraft system. So in line with the mission uphold by CM, CM has issued directives under Section 24O of Civil Aviation Act of which states that every directive issued by CAM uh, relating to the drones or US has to be brought to the attention of the person 
who has to comply with those requirements under these directives. Therefore, it is very pertinent for CM to understand the market players in Malaysia. So can we go on to the next slide? So we can explain to you what is the market players. Thank you. So as we can see, it has come to our realization that the general usage of drones in Malaysia are listed as these. Um, generally, the application submitted to CAM revolves around economical activities as well as human development skills. So you can see aerial mapping, aerial photography, agriculture, infrastructure inspection, surveillance, enforcement and training. I, I believe it's pretty much um, usual or similar all around the world. Um, the market size, um, this data is actually from CIRIM, the Standard and Industrial Research in Institute of Malaysia. Um, this data was recorded as many as 66,000 drones of all types that was legally imported into the country, which also includes more than 500 drones involved in precision agriculture. These figures illustrate the rapid growth of drone industry and drone market in Malaysia. Now let's look into the, um, the key players. The drone market is heavily concentrated with individual drone players, which may include the activity of drone utilization as part of their activities on leisure time. However, there are key players such as Aerodyne, Polar Drone, DevTech, and Pan Aviation. These key players are variables in movement or oscillation in directing the tempo of drone market in Malaysia. How do we anticipate the market direction of the drone industry uh, in the next five to 10 years? Um, it will have to closely affiliate with the socioeconomic point of view and full utilization of drone technology, such as urban delivery, urban air mobility, and long range delivery, which operations may be conducted via cross border between states. Thank you. Next slide, please. Okay. Then, next thing that we would like to talk about is the US regulatory stakeholders in Malaysia. The Ministry of Transport takes on responsibility of ensuring the country's freight transportation is safe and efficient and facilitating in the economic growth. There are two agencies under Ministry of Transport recognized as MEFCOM and CAM. CAM is one of the agencies under MOT, which is a government statutory authority that maintains an aircraft register and oversees the approval and regulation of civil aviation. So if you were to look at the number one, the Roman one, MOT and CAM, what we, the services that we provide, um, I mean, the specifications that, among the specifications that we provide would be the authorization to fly and the certificate of approval, aerial work certificate, and also special US project. But again, this is not limited. There could be also further um, as uh, the remote pilot competency and, um, and others. Okay, now if we look into the other regulatory stakeholders, the US statutory functions are, for instance, for JUPAM, where if your drone is capable of undertaking surveillance and measuring activities, such as aerial photo, aerial mapping, LIDAR, and et cetera, then the US operator must seek an approval with the Department of Survey and Mapping. The Department of Survey and Mapping's responsibility also extends into liaising with CGSO, ATM, BSPP, and also RMP to conduct a background check and ensuring that the level of security of the proposed area of the operation. So from, if you look into JUPAM and CGSO, then you, um, you can have a look at the, the, that area where it says that aerial photography or mapping permit. That's what JUPAM issues out. And for CGSO, it is on the protected prohibited area approval letter. Next, for MCMC and also CIRIM. Uh, sorry, yeah, thanks. Okay. CIRIM's function is to ensure US brought in meets the safety standards requirement for electronic equipment, and MCMC regulates and promotes the communication and multimedia industry and dedicatedly balance the overall interest of the consumer, industry, and the investor. So what they issue out is either um, an apparatus assignment 
or a certificate of conformity or a special approval. So the COC of SA is from CIRIM and from MCMC is an apprentice assignment. Okay, the next one is if your um, the agencies that is formerly mentioned earlier is carrying out their functions for the purpose here uh, intends to operate within the state matter um, for Sabah and Sarawak, they would require to, uh, require to seek for authorization letter within the state itself. So that is only pertaining to Sabah and, and Sarawak. Next slide, please. Okay, so what have we done? Like uh, I mentioned earlier that the US unit is actually in an infancy stage. So what we have published um, is actually, we have released a new civil aviation directive with regards to unmanned aircraft system in March this year. Why did we do this? It is one of our initiatives by CAM due to the surging use of drones in Malaysia. To, but we understand when we were developing these directives that the most, the most important thing is that we have to tackle the root issue before complementing it on authorization for operations relating to US. So in order to create such environment that we realize that the industry has to be filled with a vast number of competent operators with the right US knowledge. This can only be achieved by having standardized and competent training organizations. Hence, we issued out the Civil Aviation Directive 6011 Part 1. Then after, we looked at the landscape and environment of Malaysia, and then we realized that there is a high demand from the industry on agricultural methods. Therefore, we created the directives to provide a guideline, the do's and don'ts to agricultural operations utilizing drones, for the purpose of dispensing any agricultural payload or pesticides, or, and also operations that do not dispense but carry out surveillance and mapping operations. So that can be found in CAD 6011 part two. Then we also received um, uh, prior to 2021, uh, and also now, a lot of operations that is um, a bit new or tricky or uh, interesting <laughs> or unique. Yeah, I think that's a good word, unique. Okay, um, so we created a special US project and this project, uh, th th this, this directive was designed to maximize the potential of drone technology because the key point of this directive is an extensive risk assessment which was derived from a methodology created by Jarus, which is known as SORA. Because every time, actually, if you ask something different from the regulatory body, then they, that it may be different from the requirements, the, the regulatory body will ask for, where's your risk assessment? So the main thing about this directive is actually risk assessment. It's a very robust risk assessment. So examples of operation in, within this directive or the part five, is um, carriage of dangerous goods and carriage of items, research and development beyond visual and upside, and whatever other projects that um, requires additional extra support activity from the CAM because of its risk. Okay, next slide, please. So those were initiatives that we created. Um, in March 2021, but we know that we would require um, more. Um, and the only way to do this is by actually amending the regulation 140 to 144. Mm, so the amendment for the regulation 140 to 144 actually talks about a totally new set of rules and regulations, yeah, but also still maintaining the same spirit. So this new regulation and its directives will follow a few basic concepts, which is operation-centric and also risk-based. So let me first explain about operation-centric. The operation-centric focuses on the type of the operation and not 
who, what, or why it is being conducted because there is no person on board a drone. It is a remotely piloted, remotely piloted aircraft. So therefore the consequences of an incident or accident are purely dependent on where the incident or accident takes place. There'll be three operation category, which is open, specific and certified. And then there is the next one, the two basic concepts that I was mentioning. First is the operation centric and the other one is the risk space. Can you please click next? Thank you. The risk space is where the focus is on the risk that the operation itself presents. So more effort or proof is required when the risk is greater. So if you look at the bottom, there is open, low, uh, open, it's low risk, specific, medium, certified and high. So the safety assurance is in the box, uh, the columns on the right, okay? So meaning to say, if a commercial operator is intending to be operating in a low risk environment, they may be uh, in a low risk category and may not even require to obtain an operational authorization to CM prior to flight. Therefore, the risk is actually the deciding factor. Now let's look into the operation category deeper. Next slide, please. Okay. So it says here, the first category is the open category, which is an operation that presents a low or no risk to third party. The second category is a specific category, which is an operation that presents a greater risk than that of in the open category. In this category, the applicant will submit a risk assessment to the CM to validate the operational authorization. And the final category is a certified category, which is an operation that presents an equivalent risk to that of manned aviation and will be subjected to the same regulatory regime. That is certification of the aircraft, certificate of the pilots, and also certification of the operator. Um, in conclusion, the core function, core foundation and principle from these future regulations are identical with the current regulation, which is to uphold the safety of civil aviation sector without having prejudicial effect to the public interest. However, the structure of the future regulation provides flexibility and finesse, complementing on what the industry has to comply with rather than compelling the industry with rigid requirements. Next slide, please. Jeanette, are you okay so far? Do you understand the slide uh, yes. so far? Yes. Okay. Okay, Great. please go ahead. Okay. Yeah. okay, on the next slide is we realize in order to make this happen, we were required to procure a UTM system. The UTM system is a digital cloud-based platform for low altitude airspace management to enable safe, secure, efficient manned and unmanned aircraft operations. And other benefits of the UTM system is an airspace access should be efficient, fast, easy, so that it can provide automated flight authorization to the US users. Secondly, it should provide airspace monitoring. So it will ensure safety for you, for me, our family members who are also flying because the UTM monitors presence of the US in low space airspace to safeguard from confliction with men aircraft. It also ensures no rogue drones or US users with, with ill intent breaching your privacy. Thirdly, airspace management, setting up flight path for drones, meaning to say you're allowed to fly at your home, a park or anywhere you want, as long as it is in an area that is not prohibited by law for an unmanned aircraft to be flown. Next slide, please. We undertake, and we are aware in order to make this vision a reality, it is pertinent to establish multi-agency committee with those that holds legislation on US to process applications received in accordance to each regulator's legislative, with the aim to streamline the requirements of each agencies and identify a one-stop center in order to reduce the applications processing time. In order, in, sorry, in addition, the apex of this vision will not be achieved without stringent and solid cooperation between each and every government agencies and the most important limb 
of this equation is the public and also the industry players. Thank you, Jeanette. Thank you very much, uh, Akila. That's very comprehensive. I just had one question before I go come on to hi to. Can I just check when you talked about the new policy regulation? Is this implemented yet, or is it in the process of being implemented? Okay, it is in the process to be implemented. Uh, the directive, the three ones that I mentioned, the part mm. one, part two, and part five, has already been uh, published in twenty uh, March twenty twenty one. Yeah, it's already off the yeah. um, but um, the one where it talks about open, specific, and certified, we have already passed this to the legal advisor of CM, uh, and we will have to bring it up to the Ministry of Transport. And will that go through? And will that go through some sort of public consultation, or, or will it be a directive? Is a directive, and this, you know, just uh, as long as you, your legal people are uh, agree with it, it's okay. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Uh, we have actually been in, uh, engaging with some of the main industry players and um, to get together feedbacks as well. Yeah. Okay. It's a very good question, Jeanette. Thank you. It, it seems like you've been very busy then since you started off this process because you're a you know, very young agency and you've been clearly doing an awful lot of work. So I'll come on to some questions later on, but uh, let's now go over to Haitu because we've heard from two uh, civil aviation authorities and, and you know, and we now... Uh, you know, interested to hear from what, what about the communications regulator? How do they play a part in this? Uh, Akila showed she did have MCMC on there. I didn't see anything from Heath with, uh, with the uh, Australian telecoms regulator, but let's, so let's see uh, from uh, Hai Tu where and how he sees uh, the drone industry in Singapore from, you know, his perspective as a telecoms regulator. Over to you, Hai Tu. Right. Um, hi, Jeanette. Are you able to see my slides? Yes, we can. We can see them. Right, great. Right. Um, I'm just going to uh, put a bit of a disclaimer here. I, I'm not quite from the Aviation Authority. <laughs> I'm from IMDA, so my specialty is uh, uh, in comms, but I'm uh, motivated to participate in this workshop uh, to really to contribute but also to learn about uh, the drone industry development. Uh, motivated because um, we see drone application as one of the key uh, trusts uh, to propel 5G use case. So, um, and in fact, um, IMDA has actually done some study around uh, the future of 5G and we see drone uh, prominently being featured in the as a near and uh, future high impact applications for 5G. Um, yeah, and also just now, uh, I think it was uh, Jin Chun who asked whether uh, does 5G work under the water? Uh, the answer is no. <laughs> I know for sure because uh, when I try to swim with my Bluetooth headset, it doesn't work because the Bluetooth operates at the, I think it's around 2.4 or 2.5 gigahertz. So at that high frequency, it doesn't penetrate the water well. I think to, to, to penetrate the water, you, you work in the range of kilohertz. So 5G is also operating at 3.5, that's the main band. And we possibly the, the two, 2 gigahertz and even sub 1 giga, but these are all too high frequency to operate under water. So, so I thought that might be good to get that out of the way. Right, a quick, uh, really coming from a 5G perspective, a quick overview about uh, uh, 5G in Singapore. Uh, we have uh, issued about two license, 5G license to Singtel, uh, as, uh, as well as M1 Star Hub, and that's for the nationwide uh, coverage. And then we have also uh, given TPG, another operator, an Australian operator, the MM wave uh, for local coverage that is at uh, 28, uh, 26 and 28 gigahertz, which is even higher frequency for, uh, for very high throughput uh, and bandwidth. Um, again, it was mentioned in the earlier session about network slicing. One unique value proposition about 5G in Singapore, it is 
it is very SA, SA as in standalone focus. And why the emphasis on SA is because one of the key value proposition is the, the, the features of network slicing. And, and as mentioned earlier, the network slicing is not just priority, but in fact a dedicated, it's a, it's a dedicated uh, slice of the network. And this is important if your business or your enterprise operation or your drone operation is mission critical, you really want to have almost, you, you really need a dedicated part of the network, carved aside, set aside, such that it doesn't contend with other uh, form of applications or traffic or consumer traffic, and, you know, and, and therefore pre, uh, provide high reliability. So, so much for standalone network and for the network slicing that can support uh, mission critical operation like drone uh, uh, drone uh, uh, drone operations. Um, the network is progressively being rolled out since then. Uh, this is where we are today with the star the, the, the star sign. Um, we will have like fifty percent by end of twenty twenty two and nationwide coverage by end of twenty twenty five. Uh, this is the obligation, but uh, we know that the operator are pushing ahead. And we do expect uh, uh, the progress to be ahead of the obligations. Okay, this is a very busy slide, but maybe let me orientate uh, the audience here. We have on the, 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 the x-axis, the, the, the horizontal bar on the left-hand side, uh, are applications that will have impact in the longer term. On the right-hand side, uh, applications, uh, 5G applications across different industry that can be realized today or in the next one to two years, or I would say one to three years. And then on the vertical axis or the y axis, you had the low impact based on our study in terms of uh, the GDP value that can create for the industry or for the economy versus on the higher. Uh, uh, further up the, the, uh, the vertical axis, that it is a high impact uh, application. So what you want to focus on is the top two quadrant on the graph. These are high impact, short-term and long-term uh, uh, 5G application. And I have, I have highlighted some of the uh, um, application in red, and they are actually drone related, uh, like in the urban, Again, on the top right corner, we see on the urban mobility, there are drone for track inspections and maintenance. We have again drone inspection in the smart estate. On the top left-hand corner, we have drone for logistics or even remote pilotage in uh, marine time. So these are some of these applications, and we see some of these are, are high impact and, some are, and they span across both short and long term for 5G and they are drone related. And this is where uh, IMDA, you know, and even with our aviation authorities are beginning to pay a lot of attention to the development. Uh, this is just a quick overview about some of the, uh, re the regulation. I borrowed this slide from CAS. Um, so I, I wouldn't claim to be an expert in this area, but it is, Notice uh, for the business operation on the right hand side, uh, a lot of these are still, uh, um, in a, it's still uh, there's still quite a bit of requirement, especially for UAS. You still need to require a pilot, an observer, and be online or site DV uh, LOS drone require really, you know, it's not quite established yet today. We recognize that, and, uh, and in fact, um, we are working. Uh, very closely among the different uh, departments in the core of governments within Singapore to, to make it easy for the business enterprise to deploy drone uh, applications. I think similar in Malaysia, uh, this is where we have now identified uh, a point, um, so-called the Sing Singapore Science and Technology Policy um, and plan office, or we call it a very long acronym, SNTPPO. 
uh, they will be the one that really aggregate all the demand uh, onto a single, as a one-stop shop, and then working with the likes of IMDA, CAS, and even the MPA, the Marine Time uh, Authority, to really help to uh, lower the, the barrier in terms of uh, drones uh, development as well as uh, deployment in Singapore. Um, a bit about some of the program that has taken place in Singapore. We have a Chuan Chuan, we call it Chuan Chuan 5G innovation program. And um, of which there were several uh, programs, there were like um, eight uh, projects awarded. I've listed some of them here, but we'll call specifically on uh, something on the uh, urban air mobility, where we have tested unmanned aircraft systems uh, with the Marine Time Port Authority in Singapore, M1, and even Airbus. And, uh, and developed, in fact, uh, one of its kind, uh, ruckadized uh, 5G modem. Uh, and uh, it's developed by a local company here that is suited to be mounted on the, the UAS and able to support um, all kinds of weather conditions uh, operating in this region. And, and as part of this uh, particular uh, 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 project and trial, uh, we are going to make, uh, we are in fact going to launch a 5G together with MPA, the Marine Time Authority and IMDA. It's going to actually launch a 5G marine drone estate. It's going to be again another one-stop shop. We're going to get C the Aviation Authority involved, getting the operator involved, MPA involved, and the, uh, the communication uh, regulator involved, such that uh, industry player can come to uh, this particular estate and test pilot um, and, and, and their, for their drone applications. And really, again, to, to through this particular platform, we want to see how we, what are the regulatory hurdles that the industry are confronting with and how we can uh, uh, work to resolve them and make it uh, uh, smooth sailing for, all, for the development. And my final slide here again is, uh, uh, apart from our Trunch One program that I, I, I mentioned, uh, earlier this year, IMDA have also launched another 5G innovation program. And this time round is really to support uh, the commercializations of uh, 5G application. And that again, include any uh, applications and enterprise application that is uh, uh, or or oriented around robotics or drone and IoT. Uh, as well on the left hand side. And this is really now moving away from just a uh, technical trial, but to commercialization. And IMDA will in fact, the, the government of Singapore will fund up to 70% of the total solution cost. And you need not be a Singapore company as long as uh, even foreign uh, solution provider, uh, drone companies, solution product providers are welcome to Singapore to deploy innovative 5G uh, drone solution. and. IMDA is happy to, to support uh, such, uh, such a development through this Tranchu 5G innovation program. So this is a very uh, a brief um, introductions about um, 5G in Singapore, IMDA, and our particular interests and motivations in the development of drone industry in Singapore and also in the region. Thank you, and over back to you. Uh, Hi, thank you, Heidi. A, a very gr a great. I mean, all of all of our presenters today have talked about, you know, collaboration and how they might work with each other in in you know with different ministries and poly uh, within their own countries and also across the regulatory boundaries. I mean, we refer to this. Uh, I think Julia mentioned at the beginning of the whole of government approach. If we're trying to drive new sectors. We need to, uh, particularly with the communications uh, on 5G, we, we need to make sure that everybody works together and that the end users and the ecosystem can get products and services to market quickly, but in a safe way. Now, uh, I just wanted to, you know, each of you have talked about what you're doing there, but can you, about that, how you've come together uh, to, to work, but 
can you give me a little bit of an example of how it might work in practice? So say I'm a, you know, um, I want to set up a, a, a new service on the drone. How, how would I, how would I go, who do I go to and how would you ensure that that could work? So who'd like to, anyone like to address that question? Jeanette, maybe, could you clarify the service on the drone we're talking about? Yeah, well, yes, yeah, so, I mean, that's a very good, a good question <laughs> because it depends, obviously, if it's going to be, I mean, that, that's the first thing that struck me, actually. I mean, I, I, you, you do need to know a lot about what you're trying to do because obviously for some simple services, it's quite, it appears to be quite easy. But the more complex ones, you know, if you're trying, or if you're doing certain services, the regulations and the policies get more complex. So how do you, you know, how do you, how do you, how does the industry navigate that process? You know, what what can we do to make sure that that's easy to understand? You know, how how do I know what 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 uh, regulations I have to comply with? Is uh, you know, I think uh, I too said you know for the five G one that is a one stop shop, but that's like a specific um, you know uh, you know area that you're trying to do. You're promoting that, but if you you know just generally in the industry, how do you come about it? You know, you say, all right, I want to do this. What yeah, I guess it, um, <laughs> from Cass's perspective, really, it's uh, one of our focus areas when, you know, developing or implementing uh, regulation is guidance and education. If people don't know what is the, what the rules are or what they have to do uh, for certain operations, then that is just leading them down a path that we don't it inherently creates risk. So... Mm -hmm part of our role as a regulator, mm -hmm. uh, and it's actually our duties within our own regulations and our act is to promote the safety of air navigation. So that's um, through things such as we, CAS has created a, essentially a recreational uh, page, which Peter from Telstra touched on before. Um, it's a campaign called Know Your Drone. Uh, so that essentially would touch more of the recreational side, um, people wanting to fly for fun, mums and dads buying drones for your, mm. your kids and things like that. Moving into the space of a commercial operator, um, I, I do have to say there is some onus on that person to understand the environment they're operating in. Um, and, and look, that's similar to a CEO of a company understanding mm. their rights and responsibilities under an organisation. Um, however, we need in this space to ensure that we're guiding people and sending them in the right direction because it is such a novel space still and i, I do have to say that um, we haven't been around very long uh, in our past we have to provide that sort of framework to get people to where they want to go so um, part of what an example could be the bv loss standard scenarios that we are putting out to, to mm. provide those frameworks some of them include operating near objects uh, in space mm. and um, providing it's almost like a buffer zone around those objects for mm. in a very simple form and there's other there's about six uh, scenarios to be developed so that's probably from Cass's perspective is providing enough guidance to uh, give operators an ability to create a safety case that is presentable mm. to us um, mm. and we do have to uh, for lack of a better term, hold hands uh, with industry in cert at certain points. Mm. Mm. Okay, th thank you, uh, Heath. I mean, Akila, you mentioned like a regulatory sandbox type thing. Or, or, or was it high too? I think actually it was a regulatory sandbox. Do we see a role for that as, you know, one way to learn and, and to, you know, advance the, uh, the regulations in a way that uh, across the different, you know, uh, ministries? Uh, I, I think um, I think um, the, the many of the participants in this uh, workshop have mentioned earlier that this is uh, a developing area. It's a new area. Um, we are pushing the frontier, and um, but we also need to be responsible uh, uh, individuals and uh, enterprise because uh, of. Um, the impact of uh, this very powerful tools. I mean, the, the mm -hmm. drone can certainly, the, 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 whether is it uh, 
uh, uh, BVA LOS can actually um, can actually do a lot of good, but also can do a lot of harm uh, when it's not uh, done in the proper way. Mm. And I think that is where uh, that is where it's important for the enterprise to engage the regulator. And the re regulator need to do its part by being forthcoming mm. and not mm. just setting up barrier, but really able to take on such a innovation, uh, innovative initiative and work within the, the, whole, the government, the different uh, department. And I realized that regulator around the region are realizing it. They are not just typically pushing the enterprise from one department to another, but instead are thinking of the ownership and trying mm. to coordinate. And in fact, uh, I never did I talk to so many departments within uh, the Singapore government so often. And I, I do start to understand uh, the rationale behind uh, regulating some some of the the, the rationale to, to mm. regulate some of these things in order to to not just protect the environment and the people on the street, but to make sure that the, 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 the there is a healthy environment for the industry to develop. Mm. So so I think that the key thing is really to be to work with the you know not to work with the, the, the regulator. And I think for the regulator to then also take up the ownership and, and really to work through the, the various barriers and hurdles. Hmm. Akila, you mentioned about your joint, you know, group that you had. I think you called it J J J Jacquard. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jacquard. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay. I, mean, I, I thought that was quite interesting because one of the things that, you know, when we talk about, a, a number of you mentioned uh, uh, today and, and in the previous panel is about privacy, security, um, and some of those regulations are not necessarily with the, you know, Civil Asia, Civil Asia Authority, they might be with, you know, in, in Malaysia with MCMC or, uh, you know, in, in IMDA, PDP, uh, and in Australia, I'm sure it's again with the more with the regulator, a different regulator. So how do you, you know, how do you manage that? You know, we've got these coordinating bodies, but you know, it, it's it's about trying to get like stop stifling the you know the innovation, but you know, make sure as you say the security and safety is there. So can you give us sort of a little bit of an example of how that committee might work to ensure that things you know. Um, Operate or, or advance in a, a faster way. Okay, sure. Um, but it'll support me and back me up if I say something wrong or if you think I should, you should include any more information, okay? Sure. Um, but I definitely would have to echo what he then also hi to had just now about the sandbox and um, uh, other regulatory uh, people that has the US legislations. Um, so, yes, um, when we issued out the three directives about the training organization, also the unique um, operations and also the agriculture. We realized whichever way that these people would still have to adhere to the requirements of the other legislations. Um, so we created the JAKWAS, which stands for Jawatan Kuasa UAS. So Jawatan Kuasa in, um, in, in, in Malay is organization, uh, committee, yes, the committee, the committee of US, yes, so that's what JAKWAS is. So the, the, um, the request actually, when somebody wants to open up, let's just say a training organization for remote pilot, they send it to CAM. So once CAM receives this information and we have actually asked all the requirements from the other regulatory, what are the things that would actually fall into your uh, jurisdiction or your scope that you'd be interested in? So in the few, first few questions that we asked them, they have listed that other down. So we knew that if we would require to call them on our pre-application meeting. So the first meeting that we actually would have with the operator would also include the people who are required to be in the JAKWAS team. So during that meeting, the um, JAKWAS team members would explain what are the requirements that they would have to meet mm -hmm. as well. So then that is like, um, I know it's a bit, um, uh, that's like a, the one-stop system, one-stop center system that we can create for the three directives. Mm -hmm. But for in the future, like uh, when we introduce the open category, we would require to maybe for the UTM system and the registration itself, 
to to have inputs from the other JAQUAS requirements as well. So then the processing time for the authorization would be even more faster. Mm. Because if it is an open category, when we have the map from the CGSO that actually says this is a hotspot, you cannot fly here or something like that, uh, that controls the critical infrastructure. So I'm pretty sure Australia has it. So he's like, man, you're only starting it now. But okay, uh, the UTM system would have um, shown where the places that you can fly. And if you're in the open category, no authorization is required from CAM. Mm -hmm. But maybe we can check this on, on the registration to meet the other legislative requirements from other uh, US, uh, from the other committee members. Would you like to any, add on anything else? Yep. Um, uh, I would like to add uh, a little bit on, you know, when an operator requests, uh, for example, to operate uh, beyond visual line of sight operations, okay? Since BVLOS is uh, quite um, new, at least in Malaysia, uh, to be conducted or operated legally, so we uh, take the initiative to introduce uh, this CAD special UAS project. Okay, um, so with uh, this committee that um, uh, we establish uh, this JAQUAS, so we hope that we can um, facilitate okay this uh high higher risk than than normal operation like bv loss to be uh conducted in a safely manner mm -hmm. but of course there is a requirements such as risk assessment the concept of operation must be solid before we can approve uh, such operation mm -hmm. okay so uh, currently we we use um SORA, Specific Operation Risk Assessment, in order for us to evaluate, evaluate and review all the uh, uh, concept of operations mm. uh, uh, proposed by the, by the operator. Mm. So JAQUAS, in one way, we can gather all these um, agencies so that we can look into number one, the airspace concern, the ground concern, the, the uh, prohibited area, for example, when they want to uh, fly over an area which has been marked as prohibited area. So there is someone from other agencies that can look into this matter. Mm -hmm. So we want to streamline and to speed up the, the, the process yeah. for us to ensure that the operation can be mm -hmm. conducted in a safe and secure manner. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. That's very helpful. Okay. I'm just going to sort of slightly change the topic a little bit to go on to like the role of the telecommunications, the, you know, the mobile network industry. I mean, how to, how do you think 5G, you know, I mean, how, you know, with 5G and, and mobile network operators, what do you think they can add to this? You know, can we heard about that, you know, the mobile network operators could potentially participate in the UTM system, for example. Uh, could you, you know, could you give us some of your insights on that? Please? Yes, I, I, I think I mentioned earlier on uh, about um, one of the value, value propositions about 5G is the ability to, instead of building multiple dedicated networks, we can, the 5G is designed on the, such that the 3GPP have defined the network, a feature called network slicing, mm. that they actually are able now to carve out dedicated uh, net slice mm. uh, that is partitioned within the network for specific mm. operation. And this is critical because for the first time in the history of IMTS, or IMTS here stands for anything to do mm. with it. GSM to 3G, 4G, 5G, they are quite empty. And uh, the, uh, for the first time in the history of IMT, we can now actually guarantee end-to-end -end network quality. And for the first time, you can actually commit to the CIO, the CXO, the CTO of enterprise and say that you can have this part of the network, mm. you are guaranteed a certain, <clears throat> certain latency, and now you can rely on it to run your enterprise business operation, be it 
whether you're running on robots or drones, it is for, for the first time it becomes reliable. Mm -hmm. And it, it or what can I say it becomes dependable rather than uh, you know having to rely on best effort, which is mm -hmm. you know kind of difficult to tell your CEO and say, I try my best. <laughs> I think that that's <laughs> one of the, the key. Yeah, unique value proposition of 5G. And I've spoken to senior executive in the, the, the uh, in Singapore, uh, in the telco, that they are really to adjust how they roll out the network or even how they orientate the network antennas. Uh, mm -hmm. I think, again, uh, in earlier discussion, we heard that uh, whether 5G can support underwater or this 5G uh, is uh, designed to support drone operation. So uh, the MNOs are ready to even to look into this thing. Mm. Uh, 5G for the first time is going to be enterprise orientated, enterprise uh, focused rather than consumer. We may be wrong again as usual, mm. but uh, nonetheless, I think the, the MNOs are a lot more motivated uh, to work on, uh, to support the enterprise. Mm. Uh, to the extent if they need to reorientate the antenna such that they are able to support not just on the ground coverage, but also for the drone mm -hmm. operation.